The Dodgers have signed international prospect Emil Morales, and we have everything you need to know, plus a look at the Dodgers roster right now from the position player side. That's coming up next here on Dodgers Dugout. It's time for Dodger I don't care how many times this team rips my heart out, I'll never stop loving the Los Angeles Dodgers. Think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out. Hey, what's going on, Dodgers Nation? Doug McCain here. Friends call me DMAC. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. Now, if you haven't yet, do me a huge favor and subscribe to the number one Dodgers YouTube channel in the game, the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. And if you really want to support the channel, hit that like button. And just a reminder, we are still running that giveaway. We are giving away a brand new, authentic, number 17 Shohei Otani Dodgers jersey. And we are giving it away as soon as we hit 80,000 subscribers, just over 1,000 subscribers away. And all you have to do to be eligible for the giveaway is, one, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, and two, comment done down below. Now, if you're going to comment done, that's all good, but I also want more of your takes, too, because I read them all, and I love your fire Dodger takes in today's Dodgers Nation question of the day. On a scale of 1 to 10, how confident are you in the Dodgers roster at the moment? Would you make any changes? Or are you fine with this being a finished product at the moment? And as always, for all latest Dodgers news, head over to DodgersNation.com. So it doesn't matter how big or small a signing is a signing. So fire up that Dodgers signing siren because the Dodgers have signed international prospect Emil Morales. MLB Pipeline tweet out, the Dodgers have agreed to a deal with 17-year-old Spanish shortstop Emil Morales, number 14 on the top 50 international prospects list. So might seem small now, but could turn out to be big later. Typically, deals like this, they're consummated and they're started years in advance, so it's not some massive surprise with the organization or anything like that. The Dodgers did receive $5.284 million base signing pool money this season. And look, typically we've seen them go after multiple players, right? Well, this is a little bit of a different approach this offseason. Are you earmarking some of that money for next offseason when Japanese phenom pitcher Roki Sasaki could be available? I think that could absolutely be in play. But Morales is someone that has a lot of potential, a lot of upside Fangrass has him as their number two international prospect. They had this to say about Morales. Morales has perhaps the best long-term power projection among the 2024 international class infielders as most of the other prospects with wide receiver-ish builds are outfielders. Morales has wide shoulders, long levers, and a high waist that gives him the look of an early career Fernando Tatis Jr. in the uniform. Morales also has explosive power to his pull side and can already put balls out to dead center field at age 17. Unlike a lot of lanky teams, teenage hitters, Morales' bat-to-ball performance in amateur events was statistically strong on film. His hands have a late, deep move that I worry will make him late against pro velocity, but it's too early to care much about that. Morales bends well for an athlete of his size and build, and he has a decent shot to stay at shortstop. While he's a skilled fit there, it's plausible that sheer size will force him to move in his early to mid-20s. Morales is expected to sign for for about $2.5 million. So my biggest takeaway from that blurb there from Fangraphs is you see the name Fernando Tatis Jr. Yes, FTJ hasn't been the same hitter since he's been off the ringworm cream, but still he is one of the more explosive hitters in Major League Baseball. And that kind of potential, if you see it in Morales, definitely gets me excited. And look, this is a Dodgers organization that's done a great job developing catchers, developing pitchers. It's nice to see a shortstop in this organization that years down the line could pay dividends and take on that role. Yes, you have Gavin Lux, and even under the team control he's on, we're talking about Morales and someone who's way down the line here. And I think that you look at their work in international signings and what the Dodgers have been able to accomplish throughout their history, you have to feel really good about whatever the Dodgers have identified in him. And you know they believe that he has the potential to be a big contributor, to be a star for this organization. I always say about the Dodgers, if they 
like it, I love it. Because if they have seen something in him, that tells me everything I need to know because of this organization's track record. And aside from his physical tools, the potential he has as a player with his raw talent, he's received a lot of praise for his high baseball IQ, for his leadership abilities. He's said to be beyond his years as far as how mature he is as a player. So that, to me, tells me he has elite work ethic, right? And that really is the big difference with some of these prospects, guys that have the potential, that have the physical tools, the ones that match that with the work ethic, that's when you get the stars. That's when you get the guys that make their way through the system and become all-stars and key contributors to your organization. Remember, there's just over 700 people on the planet that are able to do this at the big league level, and the vast majority of these prospects don't end up making it. And that's really what separates a lot of the fringe players from the ones that ultimately do get over the hump and realize that big league dream. Now, MLB.com had this to say about Morales. Morales is a big-bodied prospect with the potential to develop into a game-changing power bat. He's shown the ability to manage the strike zone and is patient enough to draw walks consistently. When he gets his pitch, he turns on it quickly and drives the ball to all fields with authority. Morales flashes home run power and more could be on the way as he looks to build upon his six foot three, 180 pound frame. And yeah, there's some talk that you want to see him improve his mechanics, be a little more consistent with his mechanics at the plate. But guess what? That is typically the case with all young players and prospects throughout Major League Baseball. And that is why you throw them into these organizations that know what they're doing, ones that emphasize development like the Dodgers do. So I have all the faith in the world that they'll find a way to maximize this guy. And you really like the size, 6'3", 180 pounds. He's still young. He's going to fill out. He's going to add muscle. What will that do to his swing? Will that do his approach? That remains to be seen. But we saw Josue DePaula and how he has really emerged in the talent and potential that he has now, he's 6'3", right? Some of these bigger guys, you profile them as sluggers, guys that can be impact bats at the big league level. And I think that's absolutely what this guy can be. But at the shortstop position, a premium position. So we'll see. Will he stick there? I think that's the, really the big question with Morales, just kind of looking at him from what we know is, will he stick as a shortstop? Will he improve defensively? Will his frame at 6'3", of course, we know Corey Seager, he's six foot four. Derek Jeter, Cal Ripken. We've seen bigger shortstops, there's no doubt about that. But will he ultimately move to third base? Will you see him as a corner outfield? How will his bat profile? I think as a corner outfielder, it really depends on can he be a 20 to 30 plus home run guy, that sort of thing. But that's a long way down the road. But right now, you're signing him based on the potential that he does have. And I think that the Dodgers got someone that has tons of upside. And there's a lot of buzz about him all over Twitter. A lot of these sites, I mean, fan graphs having as the number two highest on their list. That really says a lot to me. But really, the biggest takeaway, I have to admit, is the fact that you got Roki Sasaki the following season. You got one player this international period. It makes you wonder, are they playing 4D chess once again? Something tells me they are. So there you have it, Emil Morales. And we're going to have an international prospects expert on next week, and we'll talk more about him. Now, switching gears to the big boy Dodgers, I want to talk about the roster a little bit here and where it stands right now. Because if you look at the position player side, they're pretty much set. I mean, outside of a potential shortstop trade for a Willie Adamas, they really want to go that route. I think they're pretty much locked in to what they have at the moment after signing Teoscar Hernandez in a signing that was made official a few days ago. Now, there have been some rumors, a little smoke about the Dodgers looking for another shortstop, but really, there hasn't been anything that really leads you to believe that they're going to pull a trigger on a deal for a shortstop. Because one, there's not really any available that they would want to trade for that they think could give them an upgrade for outside of Willie Adamas. And at the moment, it doesn't seem like a Willie Adamas trade is imminent or is something that the Brewers are seriously considering doing before the season. And look, like I've said time and time again, I think that you have to hit on some of these homegrown guys, some of these guys that are under team control for extended periods of time, like a Gavin Lux, like a James Alman. If you're going to have the Otanis and the Betzes and the Freemans, to really have a full and complete roster that has talent on the margins, you need to hit on these guys that are under team control. And I still think that Gavin 
Kevin Lux has not gotten his opportunity. Of course, there was Corey Seager. You also had the injury last season. This is really a year where it's somewhat make or break for Gavin Lux, but I think that it's the ultimate assessment year for that position for the Dodgers. And I see you saying, look, well, I mean, this is a team that says win now as possible. You sign Otani, you sign Yamamoto. Can you afford to have the shortstop position be Gavin Lux training grounds this year when at the end of the day, the reality is you don't know if he is a long-term solution, an everyday shortstop at the big league level. Just because we haven't seen it, it doesn't mean that he's not capable of doing it. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have the ability because he absolutely does. This is someone that came up as a shortstop, right? This is someone where that is his natural position. And I think that it behooves this organization to see what they have in him. Oh, and on top of that, you still have a Miguel Rojas. And Miguel Rojas, yes, as a hitter, one of the worst in the sport at that position. There's no doubt about that. On the flip side, he's one of the best defensively with the glove. And with the restricted shift, it's not the worst thing in the world to have a glove first shortstop at that position. You just want to see him be respectable at that position with the stick if he has to slide in there if Gavin Lux can't get it done. So the fact that you have someone like Miguel Rojas as a depth piece really just speaks to the overall talent level within this organization and the roster that this team has put together. This is as quality of a roster as you're going to find in the sport. So I'm not overly worried about it. But outside of that, there's really not many other moves you're going to make. Of course, you got third base with Max Muncy. I'm here to tell you this. They love Max Muncy and what he can do at the plate. They want to see him be a 30 home run guy, 100 plus RBI guy, a lefty that really can cover tons of pitches in the postseason. And he's a very skilled hitter that they're not going to move off of unless there's something out there that would knock their socks off. And I'm telling you right now, that does not exist. Now, I know everyone out there, Nolan Arenado, Nolan Arenado, that's not even being considered, right? For that to happen, it would be during the season. The Cardinals have to fall off precipitously. And even then, I don't think the birds on the bat would be very motivated to do a deal with the enemy, shake hands with the enemy, so to speak, and make a deal with the Dodgers. I still think that'd be a long shot. But let's look at the roster as it stands right now from the position player side. Catchers, Will Smith, Austin Barnes. Now, Will Smith, of course, made his first all-star team last season, dealt with some injuries. His numbers at the plate weren't as good as they were the year prior, but I do think he'll have a much better season, a more consistent season, hopefully a healthy season, which I think is the number one thing for Smitty. As far as Austin Barnes goes, we'll see if Clayton Kershaw does return. If he doesn't, does that impact Barnes' status on this team? You still have Hunter Fiducia. You have some options there. I still think with the respect that he commands on this team, the leadership he brings, developing young pitchers, the culture that he helps instill along with Dave Roberts and the leadership of this organization. I still feel like Austin Barnes is going to be around and just you hope that he can do a better job at the plate because he was much better towards the end of the season. His numbers were definitely trending in the right direction. So look, they don't pay him for his bat, right? And with the designated hitter, you don't need nine elite hitters out there to win baseball games, especially when you have Otani, Betts, and Freeman, and Smith, and Muncy, and Outman, Lux, and all these hitters. Teoscar Hernandez could be your number six hitter. He's a silver slugger. He's someone that won a silver slugger award. He's an all-star hitter. He's a 130 weighted runs created plus level hitter. So, yeah, I still think you could justify having Austin Barnes on the roster at that point. Then infielders. You have Freddie Freeman, you have Gavin Lux, Miguel Rojas, Max Muncy, and this almost feels a little weird to say, Mookie Betts. And Dave Roberts, during the winter meetings, he spilled the beans that Mookie Betts is going to be the Dodgers' everyday second baseman, which opens up a platoon situation in right field that we'll get to here in just a second. But look, from an infield quality standpoint, Freddie Freeman Played an MVP level, 29 home runs, 59 doubles. Really had the best season statistically of his career, even better than his MVP season because that was a shortened season. He did this on a full-length season. He was incredible. The big questions here are, can Max Muncy get anywhere near league average defense? And can Gavin Lux 
put together a similar season like he did in 2022 where he was a above average bat but can he do that for a full season avoid injury and play average or better defense so really it's the left side of that infield that is the liability right that is the big question the prove it side of the infield is the left side and Gavin Lux has the potential Max Muncy I think like I've always said his best defense is his offense and as long as he's producing at the plate it can justify somewhat below average defense at third base if you have to go that route just because there's not really many options of course I've talked about Miguel Vargas will he get another opportunity in a platoon situation with Max Muncy who definitely had a down year against lefties I mean, unfortunately, the roster spot just wouldn't allow that as it stands right now. But we'll see how it fares. And you're always going to have injuries and guys have slumps. Then maybe you make some moves accordingly. But that's where it stands right now. Freddie, Luxy, Miggy, Rowe, Max Muncy, Mookie Betts. Outfielders. James Altman in center field. Above average defensively. Above average with the bat. Jason Hayward. Manuel Margot. You're going to see them... Do a platoon situation there in right field. You'll see Jason Hayward in the starting lineup against right-handed pitchers. Manuel Margot above average against lefties. Hit much better outside of the trop there. If you look at his numbers outside of the trop, that gives you a little bit of encouragement. 2022, he had a 119 weighted runs created plus outside of the trop. 2023, 111 weighted runs created plus outside of the trop. He was injured in 2022. So, look, I think on a championship-level club, Manuel Margot, he has a chance to be an above-average bat and above-average defender in his role with this team. Also, he provides much-needed coverage in center field for James Altman as well, as does Chris Taylor in a pinch. But really, the big highlight here is getting that everyday left fielder a righty bat that can absolutely mash left-handed pitching and more than hold his own against righties. I think that he's the player that, yeah, of course, you're most excited to see Shohei Otani, but after that, I'm very excited to see what Teoscar Hernandez can do in this lineup in a deal where he signed a one-year deal with this Dodgers team because he wants to get right back out there in free agency and sign a nice contract, get himself a bigger bag because last year he had a down year by his standards, which was still an above-average season, a 105 way runs created plus, which is better than what the Dodgers left fielders put up last season, but he's someone that's capable of putting up much better numbers. His home road splits were skewed significantly as well. He did not hit as well inside T-Mobile ballpark there in Seattle. Played much better outside of that. So I think he's going to have a big year. So outfielders, Altman, Hernandez, Hayward, Margot, and Chris Taylor. By the way, there's a rumor that the Angels are interested in Kike Hernandez. Really no spot for Kike here at this point. Kike, at the very best, you're hoping he's a league average bat that doesn't go through too many cold spells. Because say what you about Kike Hernandez. Yes, he's a dog in the postseason. But when he goes through those regular season cold spells, it can go on for weeks, months. And you saw him struggle mightily with the Boston Red Sox. He was horrific there defensively and offensively. And look, the Dodgers just upgraded their overall talent level. And there's just not a spot for Kike Hernandez on this team. And then, of course, you have one spot, and that is for the DH spot. That is Shohei Otani, the unicorn himself. Expect him to have a monster at the plate. Yes, maybe an outside shot. He sees some time in the outfield. I don't think that's realistically going to happen. A doc talked a little bit about that, but he's just going to rake at the plate. That's what he's going to do. He's going to hit 30 to 40 plus home runs. He's going to hit close to 300. He's going to hit a lot of doubles. He's going to hit the ball hard all season long. And you can expect a MVP level season at the plate from Shohei Otani. I don't think there's any doubt about that, especially you bat him there in the two hole in between Mookie and in between Freddie Freeman. You got that protection there. I am so excited to see Shohei Otani at Dodger Stadium. It gives me chills gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. So the roster is essentially set outside if you want to try to trade Gavin Lux, which I don't think they want to do at this point. So you have your offense, you have your position players, and you have a roster that on paper is one of the best and deepest lineups in the sport. I feel really, really good about it. The icing on top, the cherry on top was 
Teoscar Hernandez. That took this offseason from an A++ to an A++++, right? And that's exactly what that accomplished. Now, as far as the pitchers, we'll talk about this for a quick second here. You guys know that I've been pushing for another depth piece, possibly a veteran starter that you could count on to eat innings if you needed him to, right? A guy that a little more dependable when you consider Walker Buehler returning from another injury, Dustin May, maybe you get him back. Maybe you don't even get him back towards the end next year. Kershaw, does he come back towards the end next year after you possibly re-signing? We still don't know about that. The big ones, though, Yoshinobu Yamamoto transitioning from NPB, the NPB, to MLB. And a lot of major differences, an adjustment period. I still think we saw Kodai Senga last season. We saw Japanese pitchers really hit the ground running right away. I think he will do the same. But you don't want to burn him to the ground. The Japanese schedule is different, right? Pitching once a week. The mound's different. Ball's different. All that stuff is different. Hitters are different. He's adjusting to life outside of his own country, right? So do you want to put too much stress on him? Then Glass now, of course, we know that he's someone who hasn't pitched more than 21 games in a regular season, hasn't thrown over 120 innings. So definitely think that they're still possibly considering another starting pitcher, but one of those pitchers at the moment doesn't appear to be Shane Bieber because John Heyman of the New York Post, he wrote, though one GM said the Guardians are still talking about star pitcher Shane Bieber, the latest word is that a trade involving Bieber is very unlikely. The Guardians have a chance to win the AL Central, so it was always going to be difficult to thread that needle. So that's massive. I mean, Shane Bieber is someone who has one more year of team control, he could really help this team if you wanted to flip him in a deal that included Emmanuel Classe. Well, right now, the biggest takeaway is it feels like the Guardians are going to compete. They want to win. AL Central, very winnable division. NL Central, very winnable division. So the Brewers with Burns and Adamas, the Guardians with Bieber and Class A. Right now, it doesn't feel like those players are going to be traded during the offseason. So the Dodgers, stand pat, keep your prospects. You made the deal for Michael Bush to help replenish the farm system, which I think was the right move in that situation. Look, you're stacked. You have a great roster. You don't have to be desperate, right? You don't have to do that. The Dodgers are in a great position right now, and that's where they stand. Also, these young guys, too. Landon Knack, Frosso. I mean, Michael Grove, Gavin Stone, I think, is one to watch. Do not sell your Gavin Stone stock for next season. I think that he's going to have another opportunity at the big league level. And with the sinker being brought back, the cutter, the command, the confidence that he got with his performance there in the PCL championship and the 19 swings and misses we saw in that game and some of the performance we saw lay from him, I still think that he's someone that will get an opportunity this year. And I think that you can lean on some of those young Dodgers starting pitchers to get innings out of them. But that's going to do for this episode of Dodgers Dugout. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me on X and Instagram at DMAC underscore LA. Now, if you haven't yet, do me a huge favor and subscribe to the Dodgers Nation YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Hit that like button. Remember to comment done down below and be sure that you're subscribed so you will be eligible for the Shohei Otani number 17 Authentic Dodgers jersey once we hit 80,000 subscribers. That's all you have to do. And we're going to be doing tons of giveaways all season long. Autograph baseballs, autograph hats, whatever it may be. We're going to do a whole episode on what you guys want to see us give away. But that is going to do it. I appreciate you guys, as always, the best fans in the game. Remember, nothing brings us together quite like Dodger baseball. And until next time, think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out. 